What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here within the GSD Mode Podcast, where every single week we interview top real estate agents and top entrepreneurs that are straight up dominating their space. These are people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves, for their families, and truly out there just getting shit done, as well as uh, I'm on a mission to go out there and impact others' lives. And that's why they choose to take time out of the busy day to jump on the show and, and share all their amazing knowledge with us. So, today, guys, we got another amazing, epic, special guest on the show. Um, so our, our guest today, you guys, um, is the principal bo- uh, broker and founder of Present Financial Properties in Orange County. Um, and, and this is a guy that uh, um, you know, specializes in, in a lot of different things, residential real estate, as well as financial investments, um, as well as social media. Um, so really, really stoked and honored to have Sina Azari on the show. Show my friend. Josh, what's up, man? Thanks for your time. Looking forward to this. Yeah, great no, show, st- by the way. Yeah, no, thank you so much, man. I, I uh, yeah, I'm stoked, dude. This is gonna be a lot of fun, man. Um, you know, anybody that's uh, uh, you know, my two loves when it comes to business, man, is you know, real estate systems and and, and digital marketing, right? So, um, so really All excited day. to just pick your brain, man, and see what you're doing. It's um, cool. um, you know, that digital online space is is you know, I don't want to say I hate the word disruption, right? It's just change and it's inevitable, but you know, it, it's made the game overall for all businesses just, I don't know, so much more, more affordable. And I, I used to say, um, and when I say I used to say, I stole it from somebody, you know, right? Uh, but it was like, hey, look, you, and, and at least in real estate, it's like, look, you got two choices. You could be rich or you could be famous, you know, but, you, but just pick and choose which one, you know, right? But now with social media and these other mediums, you're like, you can, you can 100% be both. be both and you need to do both. Mm-hmm. You know, Great right? point, man. So, um, Great point. But, before we jump in today, uh, um, you know, to what you're doing today, man, I'm always intrigued in our guest journeys that really led them to, to where they're at in the first place. So if you were to wind the clocks, whatever, whatever that looks like, how did your entrepreneur journey begin and what led you into real estate? Cool, man. Well, uh, my, my journey began in entrepreneurship out of necessity of making a better living than what any hourly wage would have uh, afforded to give me. I'm 39 years old, and at 23, I graduated college. I'm from the Bay Area. I went to San Francisco State University, so go Bay. But after graduating college, my background is or was in physiology. My goal was to become a dentist. And after graduating school, uh, I didn't get into any dental schools uh, for grad school. And my options with a physiology degree was to either work in like a research lab or a pharmaceutical firm. That would be, I guess, the greatest potential. And just that whole corporate growth record and track and uh, climbing up that ladder wasn't something that interests me when I saw how it started, where it began at, and the incomes that you get making a bachelor's degree just isn't what it used to be 20, 30 years ago. So, um, you know, I I had a crush on this girl who was an administrator at an insurance financial firm. We were talking on the phone and she recruited me to come in for an interview and after I went in, saw that opportunity, I definitely had the confidence to say, hey, let me give this a shot. I got my insurance license first back in 2003. After a couple years of having a good run building that business, um, my mom actually was my greatest influence and mentor. I was 25 at the time. And she said, you know what, Cena, if you're making some decent money, especially in the Bay Area, real estate was, was blowing up at this time. She said, you should go and invest and get yourself either a studio or one bedroom. And uh, what's crazy is I went to make this purchase and you needed 3% earnest money, which is pretty common. And uh, the condo back then was about $440,000. I needed, I don't know, give or take about 20 grand, something like that, just under that 18,000, 16,000. And um, I was gathering the resources that I had and I didn't want to deplete the savings that I did have because I was also spending money at this age, you know, 25, you want to have everything real fast. She said, you know, why don't you go get your real estate license and the developer will give you commissions at the end of the sale, which will reimburse you for your earnest monies and replenish the savings that you put into the home. So I originally got my real estate license out of the goal of just covering my own commissions on my first purchase. And from that, I started to leverage and use it for additional investments, flipping properties for friends, family, which led to 2017, fast forward many years later. I got my broker's license in California and we started a brokerage named Present Financial Properties in 2017, September of 2017. Yeah, love it, man. So I got a couple follow-up questions, man. So um, first off, dude, like why dentistry? I mean, what, what led you to... <laughs> <laughs> that's, a good, 
question, man. You know, I always had a dream to uh, work inside people's mouths, man. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just totally kidding. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I, I Dentistry was influenced to me because my brother-in-law is, is a dentist. Um, he's someone that I uh, look up to a lot. He, he was an inspiration to me while I was going to college. And I said, hey, if I could follow his footsteps and do what he does, I was trying to identify what it is I wanted to do. And I just didn't know. So I said, dentistry is a solid career. Everyone needs them. Uh, you know, your oral health is, is incredibly important because it's an indicator for many other health conditions and concerns. So I, I felt it was a win-win and it was rewarding. You know? So that was, that was why dentistry. Yeah, love it, man. So then, you know, I mean, your mom, she, she I mean, she sounds like she's a, 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 just a lot of brilliant insight, you know, right? Like, Appreciate that. And most parents wouldn't be like, oh, hey, like, like to think outside the box to go get your real estate license. They, you know, most parents and just people would be like, well, save more, sell your stuff, budget, you know, right? Um, I mean, was, is your mom an entrepreneur as well? Or like, I mean, where does that insight come from? It's funny you ask that, Josh. Now she is. Um, in 2005, when she gave me these recommendations, she wasn't. She was working corporate, but her dream was to always be in real estate. And she couldn't because she was a single mother. She raised myself and my sister. So she had to sacrifice her time to having an hourly wage and making a, a fixed income because she just couldn't take the risk of building from scratch in an entrepreneurial world. So after my sister and I became independent, she wanted to pursue that dream even more. And I think, or I'm pretty confident that she was trying to live it out through maybe her kids in the beginning. And real estate was something that she always would tell us while we're growing up. She said, you know what, if you want to be wealthy, you want to have assets, you want to retire comfortably, you put your money in land. Wow. Yeah. And we grew up here in those words. Yeah. So. I love that, man. Yeah. So yeah. she was always like the, the closet entrepreneur that just had to wait for the right time to jump in. Is she, is she in real estate now? What does she do? She, she is now. She is now. It's been about um, 11 years. She started a property management firm in the Bay Area. It's named the Zari Property Management. It's actually, fortunately, she's, she's busted her tail, but she's built it to become the number one property management firm in the Bay which wasn't an easy task, but she did this because of the uh, economy back in 08, once the market crashed, as far as sales goes, she's like, you know what, Sina, all these investors that have all these properties that they bought with these crazy loans, they now need to fill them with tenants. So I'm gonna just shift into property management and start finding tenants for these vacant homes. And that led to another to where she's managing well over uh, maybe a couple thousand properties now. Yeah, well, and what a great market for that, man. Of You know, like, I mean, you look at San Francisco. I don't know if there's another place on the planet that has lower inventory, you know, right? And prices are so Ridiculous. insane up there Ridiculous. where it's like people have to rent. Oh, man. You got we, – we, we bought a two-bedroom back in, uh, I'd like to say maybe 06 for like 745 750 In 09, it was well, worth well over nine. Now that same two-bedroom is worth close to $2 million. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Awesome, man. So then, all right, so, so you jump into real estate really just to, to get the code broke to, you know, um, was it having experiencing like what the transaction was where you just kind of had this epiphany of like, man, like this, I, I got this, I can do this and, you know, do it. Or was it just straight up for investments in the beginning? No, it was, it was in the beginning to, to buy my own first home. You know, I, I was, I, I didn't want to rent for, for, I wanted to rent as least as possible, which is so interesting because now so many of the influencers out there, they're talking about you should rent and buy investments instead of owning your own home, which I, I still disagree with to a certain degree. But um, for, for me, it was growing up uh, as a renter, you know, my mom being a renter our whole life, she bought our first home when she was 56, 57. But growing up in various apartments, and then I remember I was like 14 or 15, we had rented a smaller house and it was really exciting to rent a house. But we were renting this whole time. And uh, I had a fascination to learn about money and business uh, while I was going to college and school because even as a dentist, you're going to run your own practice. So any way you can have tax advantages, uh, especially if you start making good money, real estate is is one of the most favorable ways to start deducting some of those earnings through your interest deductions on having a mortgage. So to me, it was uh, you know inbred in me growing up saying, you, you got to own a home. And if you can own multiple homes, do so. You know, My mom was always telling me, um, the more homes and land you can own and the less you have to sell, the better you're going to be. But if you have to sell them, sell them temporarily to buy another one. Yeah. Love it, dude. Yeah. Love it, man. So, all right. So you, you kind of entered the real estate game, like when the market was hot and we all know what followed, right? The, the, you know, 
some tough times, man. Um, a lot of people that were investing, you know, got, got caught and got hit. And, and, um, a lot of people didn't make it out of that. Right. Uh, um, I mean, we, I got into real estate in 2005 and it was like, man, the, the top agents in the Valley, right. When the market crashed, you never heard of them again. You know, right. And then you know, people have a difficult time with those transitions. Um, and, and I don't know if you had a difficult time or not, but you obviously you made it through and you made it out and kept growing with that. So, um, and the reason that, you know, I know it's a long time ago, but the reason I like to bring it up is, you know, right. I mean, history repeats itself and, and it's inevitable. I mean, maybe it won't be as severe as it was, who knows, not as a crystal ball, but you know, it's inevitable that it's going to happen. And, you know, it, with your brokerage, I'm sure you experience this, but most agents now that enter the space, like they, they know nothing other than this insane, crazy bull market that we've experienced. Right. It's like, look guys, this isn't the freaking norm. Like you got to be ready for corrections and, you know, you're probably never going to see this bull market that we've been out of for this long again in your real estate career, you know, right? So can you kind of just shed some light on, on what those years were like and maybe what you did to pivot and transition and, and, you know, overcome if you had to overcome adversity in those times and, and how you, how you made it through. Yeah. You know, um, one thing is that if people aren't buying and selling, then they're still renting. So as long as you, you get creative and innovative of either predicting the trends or plugging into change, once um, you feel or see it coming across, you should be able to continue growing because no matter what market exists, people are still doing transactions. People are still making money. Same with the stock market. You know, when the market goes down or crashes, there are people who make great money uh, shorting those, those stocks. They, they predicted it was going to go down and they're making some, some good returns. Same goes with real estate. You know, when, when that market bust and all of a sudden foreclosures hit everywhere, especially in Southern California, San Bernardino County was the second most devastated hit county outside of Flint, Michigan in the United States. There was a lot of people that went into that county and bought a lot of distressed homes that ended up having a lot of inventory that they ended up renting out for pretty competitive rates, or they ended up selling it and still making a profit. So, you know, there's two ways to look at the, the changes in the market. One way is to say, hey, it's devastating. What are we going to do? Or saying, hey, you know what? It's devastating to those that don't understand how to, cap how to capitalize on the moment. And um, I, my mindset is every market's a great market. Yeah. Um, and it's, a, it's an abundant opportunity out there, especially with programs like yours, uh, leveraging social media, um, the way to connect and network and just get your message out there, find some individuals who are looking for your services, being able to partner and provide value to one another. Um, the opportunity is grand. And I, I don't believe that we've ever lived in a moment to have so much opportunity as we do now as entrepreneurs, no matter what side you look at it, whether it's distressed properties or a, um, you know, a, a, a buyer's market with tremendous amount of inventory. Yeah, no, I love it, man. It's, it's, it's such a great mindset to have. And it's, it's the right mindset to have, you know, I mean, you hear the, you know, I'm sure it comes from the media, you know, right. But a lot of these, you know, it's like, if the market's not a seller's market appreciating, that's the only way they you know, classify as a good market or a great market. Right. And it's, right. Like you said, man, it's, the market's always great. It's always great for somebody. And as real estate agents, it's just our job to, to identify whom is it Bingo. great for. And then bam, you just Bingo. play that lane. Um, Josh, you nailed it, man. That's it. You nailed it. So then, so then from there, like, so this all started to, for the cost for, for your own place, we talk, or as you talked about, um, you know, and then it was other investments. At what point did this become a career and you started actively, you know, becoming a real estate agent and, and you know, going down that path? Um, it, it was, it, it became a career probably after two years into having my license, um, because it, again, it was such an abundant opportunity and there were so many trans transactions coming that we were scaling growth. We started to, uh, brand a lot more of our strategy. We expanded from the Bay area, moved down to Southern California, and it's been a career for well over uh, 10, 12 years now. And in California, you have to have a, a broker's license to be able to employ other sales agents. If not, you're an independent producer. So until I was able to get my hands on a broker's license or, or qualifying to earn and get that broker's license, um, I was limited to being a salesperson working for a broker or reporting to a broker and abiding by their rules. And as an agent, when I started, I was working with a transactional broker. So it wasn't about building teams. It wasn't going to a brick and mortar office. It was about paying a small fee for every transaction, keeping as much of the commissions as I can. And it didn't allow me to scale my growth uh, leveraging other talent. It was more about just building my own portfolio or uh, portfolios of my clients. 
But the scaling of the growth came when I became a broker and was able to start employing agents, giving them the opportunity to be able to build teams and um, continue to just multiply by, by replication and duplication, which is the funnest part. Yeah, and I love it, dude. So, because I mean, the brokerage is, is you said 2017. So, you know, was that 18 months or so that you've been? Yeah, it has. It, we, we haven't even hit two years on there. So, up to that point, I was just simply focused on buying, selling, and finding, um, you know, rentals for those that weren't in a position to buy. Because if you find someone rentals and you build that relationship with them, they're going to buy eventually. And yeah. when they do, they're going to they're know who helped them get that rental. Hopefully, we'll help them find a house. Yeah. Love it, dude. So, but I mean, it sounds like you were having a lot of success, you know, just kind of doing your own gig. Um, and you know, a lot of people don't, I don't think, you know, a lot of people say, Oh, I want to become a team leader. I want to become a broker owner, but man, there's a lot that goes into it, right. That people don't understand. Um, you know, so there had to have been at some point, some, you know, paradigm shift that made you go like, Hey, like I'm, I'm going on this path, which is going good, but what, like what created the urge to go out there and, and, just break off and do your own thing. I love that you said that, Josh. Um, it's really the era that we live in. Um, I, I've studied millennials. I'm, I, I consider myself a millennial, though a lot of people argue that I'm probably older than that, which is okay. I'm probably on that cusp or border at, at 39 now. But the millennial um, generation is the largest generation to have ever hit our country and our existence. They're larger than the baby boomers. And right now, I believe we're experiencing what's considered the, the present financial storm. And the reason why I call it the present financial storm is because you got all these baby boomers, 70 plus million of them that are retired. They're looking to downsize. They're looking to move into assisted living, into uh, CCRCs or continued care retirement communities where they have um, a little bit less headaches to worry about when it comes to property ownership, but they still live and own their home. And you're going to have a lot of shift from generation shift. And this millennial generation, what intrigues me about them is that, or us, I should say, is we're the largest and there's so many of us. We're going to represent about 75% of the workforce by 2025. And I figured there's going to be a lot of people that are going to start to jump on attracting that talent then, which is just going to be a little late. You, you, get, you got to be early. So I immediately recognized the opportunity of the talent that's going to be flooding our um, landscape, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship. And I wanted to have and create a platform for these millennials to plug into. So the brokerage was driven by really the demand and need of where are these future realtors going to hang their license. And the traditional shops are, in my opinion, they're dying. I don't want to mention them just because I have nothing against them, but they're dying. They're, that's the old school way of doing business. Now it's all about innovation. They want to leverage technology. They want to leverage the way we connect, especially with social media and whatnot. So I wanted to create a house that welcomes that and allows us to scale accordingly, backed and driven by millennial talent. So, you know, I mean, we've got a lot of team leaders and broker owners that listen to this podcast and, and a lot of people are just confused right now, man, of, of how to pivot, you know, cause you have all these, you know, disruptors, open doors, and I mean, all these different models and, you know, these, you know, um, hedge funds, disguised real estate companies that are, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. are, came from the tech space and, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, it, it, people are just like, dude, it's, there's a lot of confusion, right? And there's a lot of fear. There is. Um, there and that's why I love talking with guys like you. Cause it's like, you don't have any fear, man. You, you are freaking on fire and you're stoked. And, and that's why I love jam with dudes like you because it's, it's, um, you know, I just, that it, I just feed off that energy, man. Cause it's again, like, <clears throat> and just like you, man, um, between your podcast and everything else that you're doing, man. I mean, it's, it's like nine out of 10 agency talk to are freaking out right now. So there's a lot of negativity and, and, um, but the, I think the cool thing about it though, um, is, you know, you're thinking from the mind of an agent creating this brokerage to create the perfect environment for an agent, you know, right. With the millennials where you yeah. see the, the, the biggest opportunity, you know, right. Where I think, you know, unfortunately for a lot of broker owners, they don't, they didn't have that experience as, as an agent. So they're just thinking about, you know, from the brokerage level from, you know, I mean, I get, they've got to right. run a full profit business, but you know, like I, I just got done reading this, this 300 page trends report and they interviewed, you know, so many of the you know, top uh, uh, broker owners and, and, you know, the CEOs of some of the top franchises. And, you know, it's like, Hey, what are the shifts that you're making? And I'm looking at all this stuff. I'm like, look, as an agent, none of this means shit to me. Like none of this adds value. So they're like, this is what we're going to do for our agents. Or like, when you even say right. like NAR, like NAR's plan, I'm like, how is this going to help me one fucking blip? Like it's not, right. you know, right. So yeah, so no, that, you're right, man. You know, like, I, I think you're the right guy to answer this question uh, uh, and ask this question too, but it's like, 
from your experience of being an agent, being a millennial, and, and with millennials being such a massive generation coming in, like what are some of the things that you're doing on your platform to, to differentiate yourself, to, to attract that and, and go out there and dominate market share? Well, I'll tell you, first of all, Josh, I, I appreciate the compliments. And I want you to know one thing you mentioned is that um, I'm not scared or, or I don't operate by fear. And I want to correct that. I am absolutely uh, operating by fear. Uh, fear is my greatest motivation. My goal every day is to live close as I can to failure because that's where you ultimately grow. Um, it's not about having 100% certainty in everything that you do because we need some uncertainty to allow us to get uncomfortable and grow. And we grow through those moments. So every day uh, I am operating and driven by fear. Believe that. Uh, when it comes to our brokers, though, uh, two or a few questions or thoughts that came to my mind is, first of all, why? Why do I want to, why do I want to be a broker? A lot of people want to be team leaders or just build a team because they see someone else doing it and they feel that it's going to give them more success. I ultimately wanted to do it because I wanted to create an opportunity that I always envisioned for myself that wasn't there. I wanted to make that for our agents and I wanted to, to have that be something that people can plug into, learn, grow from, and potentially share it with others from the success that, that they achieve. A couple areas that I feel we're providing some differences or uh, additional value is one we we teach all of our agents on how to invest it's not just about how to go and buy and sell and role playing with how to get listings or clients we teach them how to invest we teach them the why behind investing and the more of the mindset that we get our agents to be into as close as they can to their prospects the same wavelength and spectrum their conversations will be the synergy and energy will be, and that's important. So our agents understand the purpose behind investing, the different ways of investing, the advantages behind investing. Uh, and then from that knowledge, we go into the basics of, you know, FISBOs, expired listings, um, you know, open houses, farming, et cetera. And that's, that's, that's the difference maker. So many agents are just with the shop to where they understand the agent lingo because they're great agents but many of them don't know anything about investing. Yeah. And here they are trying to help an investor buy or sell property or to add to their portfolio. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, whether it's an investor or, or, I mean, cause no matter what, it's an investment, right? Whether it's a personal residence or, or whatever. And, buyers and, investors. and, you know, I mean, I, like the question I get like daily in Facebook groups and whatever is, is, well, man, how do I combat these discounters and how do I show my value to get my full commission? I'm like, well, like you got to deliver more value. Like, like, you know, what they're saying is they, they don't, from what you presented to them, they don't see the value in you compared to somebody else. You got to figure out how to articulate that. And it sounds like you're, because they know the investment side so well, they're able to articulate much differently. I mean, most real estate agents had know nothing about, um, right. um, you know, financing and, and, right. and what this looks like and having those, you know, higher level conversations. Yeah. Well said, most don't even have a business plan. I mean, I, I've, I've, spoken at, at many different forums. I serve on three committees for CAR, which is the California Association of Realtors. I'm on the board of uh, advisory leadership for 2019 for NAR, the National Association of Realtors. And I've connected with hundreds, maybe if not into the thousands of real estate agents. And majority of them, one, they don't have a business plan. They don't have targets and measurements for what they want to achieve every quarter. They don't have um, goals in, in their own real estate portfolio, what, what they want it to look like. They don't know the why. They don't look at the landscape outside of their area because they're so zoned in just on their own backyard, not recognizing that the outside areas have influence on their own backyard. So there's a lot of different metrics and factors that come in play that can help elevate someone's success, but they either don't invest in themselves to seek that, or they're just being mentored or told by the wrong individuals to keep their head down and just keep knocking on doors and shaking hands because that broker or that mentor is just counting that override or that spread where my goal is for all of our agents to become independent. If they want to become brokers, go build your own brokerage. I mean, um, we grow through growing others and that's been the best philosophy that we've applied. Yeah. I love it, man. You know, I was, uh, you know, it's probably, when was this? This was in October. I had an event that I put out here in Phoenix and, and one of my good friends, uh, Leo Pereja, I don't know if you know Leo, but he's the owner of Remind. And awesome. um, he came out and spoke at the event and, Man, he just, he just dropped some knowledge that just it like shook me in a way that I haven't been shaken in my 14-year career. And, you know, because we were, we were talking a lot about disruption and, and being able to 
transition and pivot ourselves, you know, for what all this looks like, however right. it's going to go. None of us know we don't have a crystal ball, but being prepared no matter what, you know, right. And, he, and he's like, look, like so many agents are, are, are freaked out about like, like commission objections. Right. And he's like, but like you, you know, he, he's a, a, a person, like he invested heavily himself. And, and so he's like, look, I'd go on a listing presentation and I'd be like, okay, Hey, here is an immediate offer where I'll buy your house right now. Right. Then from there it was like, okay, Hey, here's how, uh, uh, the price if you were to sell your home as is right now, here is the ROI. If you put 10 grand into these things, you can get 30 grand back. Yeah. Right. And then up the, then there may be a complete remodel that might be 60. And then right. he would, you know, he didn't, he didn't own the construction crews, but he had the construction crews that he worked with that he knew were great and right. It was like, and I'll manage the projects for you. And he's like, when, when I came in with that level of value, I had no competition. He was the number one Rem or Keller Williams agent in the world. So his awesome. team before he sells broke uh, or is his team, not a brokerage, mm -hmm. but um, do 10 agents doing 600 transactions a year, year over year. But it was because of a lot of the investment clients and they taught their clients too. And, you know, but it, so I'm sitting there listening to that. I'm like, dude, like on, and this is terrible, man, but just being transparent and honest, like I don't freaking know if somebody puts in granite that for Mike, they put in granite, what that return is. Yeah. Right? right. So then I start thinking, I'm like, dude, our whole, my whole diet crew, like every mastermind, every training, like it's about legion and, and whatever. And I get all of that. But I've never right. been in one room where it's like, hey, we're going to talk about something today that actually adds value to our clients. Like learning to become well, great stagers, learning how to, to do specific improvements and well, where they get their all, all, all. Like we don't do any of that shit. And dude, I, well, you know, I just sold my 6,000 home as a team, you know, 13 and a half years of the business. And I, I don't know crap. And I'm like, right. like, I'm like, dude, I'm disappointed in myself. I mean, thank God I had the epiphany. But that's like our 2019 plan is like, we got to get educated on this. You know, well, right? Seven. So- you know, what, what do you see the value of that? You know, right. Um, you know, cause it's, it's like, look, commission, like every objection is a lack of education, right? They're just not seeing the value in you and you guys can go in there and articulate it in a whole different manner. Well, you know, Josh, it's interesting. You start off by talking about maybe discounting commissions and what do people do about that? And this is, um, I, 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 I've had a different view on this than most people I connect with. And most agents or brokers will say we don't discount commissions. If they're getting a discount broker, go get it. You get what you pay for, et cetera. And to a, to a certain extent, that's true. However, we're, we're entrepreneurs and we're in a negotiation game. We're in a negotiation business. And in real estate, everything is negotiable from who pays uh, transfer taxes, who pays escrow fees, who pays, I mean, everything, title, et cetera. And I also believe that commissions are negotiable. So one thing that I will sound different than most people is, do we discount our commissions? If people want to consider the discount, the answer is yes. We look at it as a commission rate. And based on the amount of work we're going to put into the deal, our commissions will vary. Not everybody pays 3% because that's what the standard is. We're not here to live by the standard. We're here to create our business. And we're not, we're not worried that Purple Brick or Johnny's brokerage charges more or less. Let them do what they want to do. We're going to charge what's fair to us. And individuals, again, uh, they, they keep saying, oh, you can't discount it, you can't discount it. But unfortunately, many of those people do it. They just do it secretly or they're ashamed to mention it. And yeah. I don't look at it as discounting. We charge a fee. 3% is standard based on what the industry's recommended. Sometimes we do three. Sometimes we'll do 1.75 or two. It, again, it depends on the work, depends on how much we're going to invest on making the deal successful. And um, that's one thing to where I'll, I'll sound a little different than most other people. Because I'm not against openly admitting that, yes, our fees vary based on the services we provide. It's not set that everyone is going to have the same. You get the same level of service, but it doesn't mean that we're going to have the same hustle as far as amount of work to do this transaction. Some require a lot more work than others. And the ones that are slam dunk deals or easy peasies, why are we going to charge them the same that we would charge someone that's going to take, you know, three to five weeks of legwork on? It's, just, it's not good business acumen. Yeah, no, I love that, dude. And I mean, the reality is, if you look at every other industry on this planet outside of outside of real estate, you know, right, with technology and with automation, like prices have went down. I mean, it's it's right. inevitable that we're going to have that compression, and and you're just facing it head on. Where everybody else is going to be reactive, you're being proactive. And I love the menu of services, right? It's like, I, so I came from the health club industry, and in the health clubs is like, hey, look, if you want to be the do-it-yourselfer, here here here's the twenty dollar month membership. All right, well, okay, now you want group exercise classes in addition to that? Okay, that's 30 bucks. Oh, you want like the cream of the crop personal training? That's 500 bucks a month. Oh, you can't quite afford that? Okay, we have three-person group training at 199 Like we had a, an array of options because um, our goal is, hey, we want to be their go-to place to help them accomplish their health and fitness goals. So if we look at it, like, well hey, said. 
we should be there to help our, the consumer um, go out there and accomplish their real estate goals. And, and we have one play for them, right? Like what other business has one play? Yeah, right. Um, you well know, but, yeah, yeah, I love the menu of options, dude. Um, can you give us like an example of like, you know, because just being honest, man, like I'm trying sure. to do, like I'm trying to go up, come up with everything from like a 997 FISBO, you know, mm -hmm. right? Well, we put it on the MLS and like kind of have like a digital product where we teach them how to do their own ads. But cool. then they can take that and if they're not successful, they can apply that to, you know, another option, right? But then having it where it's like, so, you know, if, when I say 1%, that's not counting the code broke to the buyer's agent, but sure. like, a, you know, 1%, 2%, 3%. And then like, on like the, the 7 percenter where we get 4%, like that would be the, the cream of the crop. Like we bring in our house cleaners, stagers, landscapers, and Bingo. just make it where it's an ease of use. And uh, um, can you give us an idea of like some of what some of those array of options look like that you guys? Yeah, have you know, you, 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 you just said it. For example, if you're, if you're transacting on a $1 million home, versus a $20 million home or a $15 million home, the commissions of 3%, that, that net payout is a big difference in yeah. number. So for individuals to um, publicly or sternly say, hey, we don't negotiate commissions or we don't discount them, I truly feel that they're shooting themselves in the foot or they're just not being honest with the public. So I'm, I'm pretty candid and open. If, if we're doing staging, um, in today's era, the agents need to cover that themselves. So yes, the additional commissions or the standard commissions you charge, those are going to be expenses that a great agent would be deducting from their commissions to outlay these expenses in advance. Or if you have relationships, you pay it at closing through uh, escrow, et cetera. But those are some of the examples that if we are just going to uh, help someone flip a home, it's not going to be all staged. We don't have to do a huge marketing campaign, aerials you know, super package photography presentation, et cetera, then why not pass that savings on to them to earn their business? Let them know that we're here to earn future transactions as well versus charging the standard rate of a 3% to someone that we would come in full staging, full aerials, full photo, full commercial, full uh, social media branding, um, mega open house party, event style uh, introduction to the community, et cetera. All those that have costs, the commissions offset those costs. But if you're not going to make those investments and the client is aware that this is the, the way we've together come across how we're going to present and sell their property, there's nothing wrong with them paying a little bit less. Yeah. Well, you know, I got licensed in, in 2005, right? So this was, we were using the razor flip phones, like scanners were just becoming a thing, Star right? Tech. Like Star tech, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was no docu sign. Like, I mean, oh, no. to do to pop four deals a month then, I mean, that was 80 hours a week. Right. Well, um, now yeah. you can do 10 deals or maybe 15 deals compared to the, sure. there's no social media, there's no YouTube. Like it was a different world. Yeah. Right. Um, You're um, right. You know, and again, when it comes to automation and saving time, like we can do more volume. And you know, I always look at, um, I think pretty much every entrepreneur is, is at this point, but obsessed with studying Jeff Bezos. And you know, if you look at like whose life is not better because of Amazon and, and Jeff Bezos every, was the yeah. most obsessed guy on the planet at, you know, best, like, they have 220,000 employees, but zero customer service reps, right? He's like, look, we have to have such great customer service where we don't have to have reps. Cause if we have to have a rep, we've already failed them. Right? Like, like the dude is just like so obsessed with the world's best customer service at the lowest prices. And if you really break down like what he's the best in the world at, it's he's the best guy on the planet at operating on the thinnest margins. Like he's just figured out. And like, if you take his close 11 competitors, they don't do 50% of the production. He's just become unstoppable at this time. Now he had to ride this line of 20 years of losing money to now become well the planet, you know, right. But he was obsessed with the consumer. And this kind of comes back to the, you know, like his real estate agents. And, and this is why like, you know, like open doors is a client of mine, you know, right? like I, I, here in Phoenix, I'm able to rep them. I mean, they're essentially they're just a hedge fund, right? So I'm able to rep them and find them properties and whatever. And I'm like, dude, they just exist because we failed the consumer as an industry as a whole. And they saw a need right? And, and like, we got to wake up and, and see that need, you know, right? And people will talk about like, like, oh, the, well, the Uber, you know, Uber of, of real estate's happening, whatever. I'm like, whose fucking life isn't better with Uber compared to taxi? Well, yeah, right? right? Like the, the conversation again, never comes up of what's best for the consumer. Yeah, right? Yeah. Like the consumer that wants the best experience, the best service, right? The best prices. And I, I think whoever, whoever delivers that to them is going to come out winning this game. Yeah, well said. It's cool that you mentioned uh, Bezos and Amazon. A lot of people don't know how much, um, 
of, of a, you know, bleeding rate they've had and how much losses they've had to get to where they are. And I still think that they're losing a lot of their products and that's a strategy. You know, he finds what's being, it's so interesting. If people study Amazon, Bezos identifies vendors that are using Amazon for distribution. What most people are buying, he ends up going and creating the competition piece, selling it less. So then people start buying his versus the vendor that was using Amazon. Eventually he doesn't need that vendor anymore, which is genius. And he actually loses money on those deals but he's making money on other areas. So it's the same goes with, with our, with, with our uh, you know, landscape in real estate. Right now, the times have changed. It's not changing, it has changed. All these uh, virtual brokerages, all these self-service shops that are helping you now sell homes yourself, we're competing with them. That person is now competing with them. The um, brokerage, uh, sort of the brokerage agent relationship wasn't as, or it's not as significant today as it used to be in the past. In the past, agents were a lot more sort of restricted or limited to what they could do without a broker. Now, you almost really don't need a broker unless you're looking for certain, I guess, value or benefits towards building your business, which is what we provide. We provide the actual offices still for agents who like to come into the office, be in an environment of uh, camaraderie, synergy, hustle, uh, accountability, we do a lot of group type presentations. We do a lot of group type activities. We do a lot of um, cross, cross selling and sharing of, of cases, which helps hedge and leverage sort of our risk of not making consistent income, which is pretty cool. Um, we're big on team building. We actually live and breathe the philosophy that if you wanna go fast, you go alone. If you wanna go far, you go with the team. And we're all about team. So agents that like to be independent and just want it to be their face, their brand, only about them, which a lot of majority of them exist, like for example, Ryan Serhant, which is awesome. Um, that's great for those agents. But then I believe a lot of those guys that are all about them and just that sort of one mold in their face, their brand, eventually they're either want, they either wanna grow into a leadership role and start to expand and build a team, or they're just gonna retire in that fashion. And those that wanna expand and build a team or plug into a team, um, you have a different philosophy or a different goal than just being that one top guy and that's all people know. And our firm, our operation is more about team-based. You know, I'm behind it because I'm the broker, but if I wasn't the actual broker holding on the license and having all the liability, I don't think that I would have been as significant because it's about our team. It's yeah. about our team. Yeah, no, I love it. Because I mean, ultimately, I'm sure you're just building the 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 environment you wished always existed, right? Uh, you, you um, nailed it, man. And, you nailed it. Uh, well, dude, in millennials, right? Like millennials, the cool thing about millennials, man, is, is there's certain things that they value more than money. It's not just about the splits, man. They, I mean, culture matters and, and being yes. a, something bigger and impactful. And, yes. and, and, and most people like that will bitch and whine about how millennials operate. It's like, no, you just mm -hmm. don't know how to create the environment they need. So can you speak? You're so to, on point, man. Yeah. Can you speak to that, man, of, of the importance of that culture, <laughs> that environment and being a part of that group, man? It's because it's like, dude, like, why do people get so crazy into politics? Yeah. You know, right. Even though they're not running or, you know, like I got one of my best friends who's like the most diehard, hardcore, uh, Un University of Michigan football team mm -hmm. fan. Right. But like, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't even play football. He didn't go to U of M. Right. Like, bro, like, but if you see somebody with the Ohio state shirt, like there's probably gonna be a fight. I'm like, why right. are you so passionate? Right. But it's because do people want to be a part of something bigger. They want to be a part of a movie. You nailed it. Man. You and nailed millennials it. You crave that more than anybody. Right. Yeah. And, and you're on point with that, Josh, uh, millennials, uh, and actually I'm, I'm the founder of what's, what's known as the millennials leadership network. And if anyone wants to look it up or check it out, you go to millennialslead.com. It's a network of millennials that want to take care of other millennials that are in leadership positions. We want to make this an international community. So, uh, we're, we're actually looking for uh, chair leaders or, or leaders within your certain city and areas that want to help expand and grow this network. But What's amazing about millennials that you said is it is truly about purpose over profits. It is about passion over paychecks. Uh, and that's a different philosophy than the generations that were there before them, because it was about, Hey, make that, uh, you know, average income or make that salary, build your family. And then you move on, you know, buy that house and it's over, et cetera. So it's interesting that you said that in the millennials, it's not just about the commission splits. It's not just about, uh, where can I pay the least amount of money for a transaction? They want to be part of something. They want to contribute. They want to be part of a larger force. They want to influence. 
Um, there was so much value behind this generation. I have so much respect. That's why I do everything to include myself as a millennial, because I see how special and important this group is. They're also the most influential, largest demographic across the globe. I mean, it is huge. I think uh, worldwide, it's over, you know, 2.1, 2.3 billion individuals are millennials. Uber, um, Facebook, um, Netflix, all these uh, new businesses, Amazon, et cetera, they're being driven and supported by millennials. Um, and even, even a lot of the, the millennials that aren't yet home buyers, they're probably going to, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie, they're probably going to go online and on the internet and try to find a, um, you know, a bot type agent to do an electronic transaction online and maybe buy their home electronically. I'm, I'm uncertain. However, the closest you can, the closer you can plug to them, the closer you can let these individuals know, especially the ones that want to get into entrepreneurship and to build a business in real estate, we've created an environment and an operation that welcomes them, promotes growth, leadership, um, and also tremendous amount of education and value because you need to know what you're talking about and be with confidence, put your client in a better position to have met you than to have not met you at all. That's important. Yeah, no, I love it, dude. So then, you know, when it comes to, you know, because one thing that you know, I see so much more with the millennial generation, um, and I even see like in my team, I and mean, we've got, you know, agents that are in their 70s and, you know, agents that are 18 years old, right? Um, like last week, for example, I brought in one of my, uh, actually my peak performance coach, you know, and she spoke uh, for, to our team for four hours, right? And it was nothing about real estate, but it was just about going deep into like, like what are your, like you got your goal and then you got your conviction. The goal pushes you, the conviction pulls you. Like, what is mm -hmm. that thing that you can't do in this life? And, you know, what was cool in there, man, is like the millennials, like they, they, they were the ones really embracing it and willing to get up and, and, and be vulnerable. And, and like, we had, we had several in tears, you know, right? I mean, that's, this girl's amazing at like just getting to the core, you know, right? But they're willing to do that internal work and have those conversations. So when it comes to your training, you know, um, cause it's like, okay, we got to teach them to be great realtors, but it's like, we want to teach them to have an, and live an epic life and have that impact on their lives. So can, can you kind of elaborate on some of the different types of trainings that you guys do, you know, right. To just like, get them like, Hey man, like we want to grow great businesses, but we're like, we want you to be, you know, future great fathers and, and mm -hmm. mothers and, well you know, like, like we want well you to said. freaking win in life. Well said, no, we, we, we do a lot of, uh, trainings and, meetings on mindset. We do a lot of mindset planning, mindset strategy. 80% of everything that we do in, uh, according to Tom Ferry as well, is mindset. So we're big on mindset. We're big on driving the why. Uh, Simon Sinek, what is your why? Especially the millennial generation. Um, they don't, they might have an idea of what that is, but didn't know how important and how significant that why is. And once you learn and uncover the why, then you go on to the how and you break down the how. And of course we do a lot of quarterly business planning. We, we break down our year into four years. Every 90 days or every 12 weeks, we call it a year or a four year, year, however people want to, it's called the, the periodization model. So every quarter we break it down and we have quarterly goals. Um, we celebrate all the small wins. Every small win becomes a larger one. Uh, we're focused just on abundance, um, on having a paradigm shift of how people see the world. Because in general, I can't speak for Arizona, but out here, um, in general, people just aren't fired up. They're, 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 they're under stress. They're very impatient, um, angry. You know, you, you cut someone off or they cut you off. It's, it's a lot of anger in there, flipping people off and not this so warm. Hello, how are you doing? Looking in the eye, respect the old school, uh, sort of etiquette that I grew up in. It's becoming diminished just because I think there's so much pressure and stress on people to get by these days. And a lot of that has to do with mindset. You know, it's a victim mentality. And our goal is that all of our millennials and all of our staff, regardless of age, that they come in uh, part of our team, they, they learn how important it is to have an abundant mindset. And once you change your mindset, so many great things come across your way. Everything happens um, for us, not to us. You know, these are some of the examples of of what it is our training is built on. Then all of the educational pieces regarding real estate, that's fairly easy for us to go over. Again, the role plays, the scripts, the FISBOs, the expired, the geo farms, the mega open houses, the commercial uh, properties, the LLP planning for investments. Those are all fairly simple when we break it down how to do that, but it's important that the why is there, that the mindset's correct, that the purpose is correct. 
um, that you're always operating as if there's hundreds of cameras watching you. So you never ever have a gray area when it comes to ethical decisions. Um, those are all the areas that we focus on. So then all of our agents can independently grow successful without us, but together we know we provide so much more value. Yeah. I love it, dude. Cause it's, you know, it's one of these things we can be, ed- and I mean, we are right. Like we have the, there's more training and more free training in real estate than any other industry out there with, right. the, least, with, with, the, with the least productive people. And you know, it's like right. one of these things of like, why aren't we doing the things we know we should be doing to create the life that we want to go out there and create. And, and, you know, I love that you, you talk about spending so much time on that. So they are taking that action. Um, you know, and, and we're in this industry historically where people don't really master their craft. Yeah, right. Like I mean, agents have been doing this game for thirty years, and they're just present. Like it's like they just repeated the same shit a year for thirty years just straight. And I'll survive, right? You know, yeah. but, but you know, the type of training you're talking about, like, it's it's straight up mastery. So is this like daily in the office, or like what is what does that kind of look like? Um, it it depends. We have retreats where we'll go away for um, two or three days, and that'll be you know you qualify for them based on production, and you usually end up growing from that retreat. But you also have a great time, and we celebrate. Sometimes the spouses are involved, so then we can have some uh, activities around partner building, which gets a little bit more personal. But it brings the partners on communicating on the same wavelength because that's also uh, you know some of the challenges that we have. I've been married for thirteen years, and communication is key to our success and having a successful marriage and relationship, whereas a lot of people don't recognize that. Um, You know, money usually is a big challenge, but I think when couples communicate about the money and have an understanding of why we're spending things a certain way or why we're saving so much for a certain way, it makes a big difference to bring people on the same page. Um, But other than the retreats, we we usually have two weekly meetings. They'll run anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half, maybe three hours, depending on the content and the material that we want to go over, the questions we're going over, the challenges that are at hand the projects that we're working on as a team, um, it, it'll vary. But yes, we, we connect at least twice a week when it comes to uh, growth and development or sharing of best practices. Now, is it, um, you know, because we're seeing, you know, less and less bricks and mortar, right, uh, um, in this space. And a lot more people want to be virtual. Is, is, is it kind of a thing where they can show up at the office, but maybe you stream it if they're at home. So it's kind of like a hybrid not, you bricks know, and mortar and virtual? We're, we're not we're not there yet. Uh, okay. we, we plan to be there because our goal is to scale this one across the state and then go across the country. Right now, we are um, in three locations. We have an office in uh, Hunt, not Huntington Beach, in Orange County in the city of Brea. Uh, we have a second office in Carlsbad, which is right north of San Diego, and then a smaller operation in San Francisco. Our San Francisco operation is a little bit more independent, um, and they're I don't want to say running their own deal, but they're not as focused on the same projects that we are in Orange County and San Diego because it's a different environment. Uh, the Bay Area is a beast of its own, and we can't apply what's happening in the Bay in Southern California. However, our Orange County and Carlsbad operations, we actually get together physically and we'll alternate between which offices that we meet in. And that's because that that face-to-face interaction, the shaking of hands, the energy in the room, it's contagious. The success, the high fives, the looking sharp or someone coming in casually, but being business professional, all that adds to the culture of what we do. And you nailed it, the word culture. Culture is very important to us. And it's tough to get a, a corp, not corporate, but a company culture. It's tough to do that over Zoom and web-based um, software. Now, it does allow you to scale your business using technology in that manner. But when it comes to the core and the culture, we, we got to be there together. And of course, not every agent makes it. Sometimes there's some personal uh, agenda that comes in the schedule or an emergency, et cetera. And we work around that. But for the most part, we're, we're there as a team together doing this uh, and building the deal. Yeah, I know. I love it, dude. And, and I couldn't agree more, man. I've went to the, I think like a lot of us entrepreneurs, like we, we live in the extremes, you know, like it's either like, man, we're meeting constantly together or it's all virtual. You know, like I've, I've went right. to both extremes and yeah, I mean, we lost a lot of the, the culture element when we went completely virtual and, right. um, you know, because real estate is one of those funky things, man. It's it's like if we're not careful for for real estate agents, it, it's you feel like you're an island all by yourself. Like we're independent yes. contractors, and it's you know, um, and you know, I don't know. I just believe of of success for osmosis, and like one thing that I and I don't know if this would have had an impact if it was done differently, but from day one, man, I always had an office in the office, and and just being in there and around the other people and the other energy. Because look, at the end of the day, man. 
like, I don't care how successful you become, you still have off days and you still need mm-hmm. teammates to pull you up. And, and you know, I, yeah. I think it's so important, man. To, to Yeah. You know, the, the office environment for us raises accountability. Uh, we, we work or, or live a motto or mantra that's called hold the rope. I'm not sure if you heard that term before. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wish I knew the, the, the name of the college coach that came up with this motto, but, um, and shame on me that I don't because we use this material and live it every day. But there was a college coach that literally uh, at the half told his basketball team to hold that rope or, or understand mentally that, that if you had your teammates hanging on the edge of the cliff and they were holding one end of the rope and you were holding the other, what are you and your team going to do as far as, as far as holding that rope? Because if you let go, you're going to lose that teammate you're going to hold it until your hands literally bleed and then until you're probably go to, going to go down with them or bring them up. So we live that philosophy of hold the rope and you can't hold the rope if you're not around. You can't hold the rope behind the screen. You can't hold the rope, uh, you know, behind a cell phone. You got to be there present in the trenches. You got to be there picking up, picking one each other up. You got to be there providing the, 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 the success stories, the value. Um, you know, you uncover a client, you want to gather two, three guys to work with you on the case. Why not? So all that happens by interacting with each other. And, and I know it's tough, especially when you, want, when you want to scale. We're working on identifying ways that we could still do this. And that's probably going to buy, be by having team leaders in those offices that also the leadership teams probably are going to meet in person uh, more often than the rest of the agencies. But that hold the rope model is tough to do behind technology. Yeah, love it, dude. So um, I want to kind of transition into, into social media, um, just because I know that you have a lot of uh, expertise in this um, and, and, and really kind of cover it in, in maybe two different ways, you know, right? Like, like ways that you're training your agents to leverage it, whether it's for new lead gen as well as, you know, uh, um, like today, you know, we hear the statistic of 88% of buyers and sellers said they love their agent with utilizing me at only 11%. Uh, redo a transaction with them because they forget their name. I'm like, the social media, it's free. And it's mm-hmm. so easy. Like, you know, I, like it doesn't make that I get before where you had to do pop buys, you know, right. But today, like it's easier than ever. Right. So from an, I'd like to hear from an agent aspect like what you guys are, how you guys are utilizing social media to have success with it. And then on your end of it, like what, what are some recommendations that you give to team leaders and broker owners? You know, right. Um, Cause it's like, look, sure. you gotta, you gotta, let the, the agent world know what you guys are doing. And, uh, um, well, I'll tell you, uh, I'm a big fan of Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, Josh, I assume you are as well. The guy's the godfather of social media. I was fortunate to hook up with him as a speaker at agent 2021 at the inaugural agent 2021. I was blessed to connect with the Vayner uh, media and Vayner experience camp to be in a speaker at their conference, mega conference at the hard rock stadium. That's coming up again, the second one in uh, January. And, Part of that uh, conference was for realtors or real estate agents, insurance agents, auto and travel industry. And we've been leveraging social media to build our brand from day one. How do we do it? One is for the broker owner side, or even if you're a team leader, uh, I believe in the three C's, which is culture creates content. So the more passionate you are, the more confident you are about your culture, share that with the world. And if there is any reasons you're not, it's an indicator of making some adjustments to to change your culture because you're afraid of its reflection on the world and people who aren't doing that because they're afraid of providing value of, of competitors taken away from them. That's a completely different challenge that a lot of people have, but we're very transparent Um, other than protecting our, you know, client privacy and material that we're not to share just for ethics and public reasons. Our operations are very transparent. If people went and researched present financial properties, or Sina Azari, you will be able to learn and uncover everything from my day-to-day transactions, our office, what it looks like, who our team is, what we do, how we celebrate, the um, you know trips we take, the homes that we close on, the business transactions that we're doing, the, the, the projects that we're working on, et cetera, because this is all content. And the more content we can share publicly, the more we're relevant to the end user or our uh, audience. Um, as far as agents go, uh, the all the social media, Uh, blastings or the post they work all the advertising spend behind it they work you know google pay-per-clicks they're very expensive today but there was a day to where these key terms were only maybe 15 20 30 cents per click now they're three to six dollars some are 15 to 20 dollars which is pretty expensive same thing goes with social media right now facebook is very inexpensive instagram is very inexpensive of course it's free to a certain extent just to create general content but if you want to start targeting prospects 
and breaking down into age groups, uh, financial backgrounds, cities, zip codes, regions, et cetera, that's going to have a spend to it, but it's very small versus what it's going to be. And this is just like real estate. You know, imagine if you bought a condo in downtown, downtown Manhattan 30, 40 years ago, you, you would have made a lot of money today. And the same goes with all this uh, social media spend. People who are holding back or uncomfortable or don't just get it. They need to dig deep. They need to dive deep. They need to learn. And they need to be less afraid of failing, trying it, than to not do it at all. Because this is one of the reasons why we're living in the most abundant opportunity to be an entrepreneur and building a business. Never have we had the chance of being able to communicate with someone on the other end of the globe immediately for free. Yeah. Never. And people just are underutilizing or underestimating its potential. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree yeah. more, man. It's, it's, uh, you know, I got all, all the people that reach out to me like, oh, so you're, you're, you know, you're good at, or you're good at Facebook or you do Facebook leads. And I'm like, man, like, it's when you look at it, like, dude, like, it doesn't matter if it's the mailbox or the newspaper or the TV or Facebook. It just happens to be wherever the eyeballs are and you just yes. master marketing strategy, right? Because then it does like, if Amazon replaces Facebook, you're good, right? Um, it's just showing up where the eyeballs are. And yeah, there's a learning curve. And I, man, it drives me nuts when I hear real estate agents say, oh, I don't do that. It's you know, too complicated, you know, whatever. But I'm like, right. I, I always go back to, you know, one of my favorite Einstein quotes of, you know, a man's, uh, a man's intelligence is not defined by his IQ, but instead by his ability to change, shift, and adapt. Yeah, awesome. right. I'm like, when agents tell me like, oh, well, I'm not, I don't want to learn systems and technology and automation, social media. I'm like, all right, then like, might as well fucking hang up your license right now. Cause you're not going <laughs> to, you know, you're not going to make this game, dude. Yeah. And a lot of people that don't want to learn it, then you got to outsource it, you know, and it's going to cost yeah. you some money. But if you don't want to make that spend, then spend that time learning it. We got 168 hours a week. That's a lot of time. People are living by this 24 hour day rule and uh, they're running out of time every day. Well, we all have the same 24 hours. And some days will be busier than others. But generally, if you start breaking that down into a week, 168 hours a week is a long time. You take 40 hours for a full work week, for example, of work and minus that from 168. You take a couple hours a day if you want to go to the gym every day. Let's say you sleep seven hours a day, which many people don't, especially entrepreneurs. But even if you did, you put seven hours a day of sleep. You're still left with 50, 60 hours at the end of every week. What are you doing with that time? Yeah. Pick up a book. Pick up, you know, Gary Vee's crushing it. Pick up, uh, you know, jab, jab, jab. Pick up something on social media, pick up a, a Zuckerberg book. I mean, any, go online and, and download free eBooks or just start Google searching and surfing. There's so much blogging and blogging out there on how to create this material and content on an educational basis. You really don't have to pay money for an expert unless you can afford to, or you, or you just don't want to put the work behind doing it yourself. But it is a must to get out there. If you want to grow in the current era, if people are still doing what they did 10 years ago to get them to where they are today, it's not going to be the same activity that's going to get you to where you want to be, for example, five or 10 years from now. You got to evolve. And as you mentioned it, um, you know, it's all about change. And the, those that are quickest to adapt will lead. You know, Jack Welch, the uh, CEO of GE, the uh, author of a book called Winning, awesome book. I recommend a lot of people to pick up that book. It's called Winning. Uh, one of the quotes that he says, he has five or six takeaways of what you must do to win. And one of them is you must embrace and adapt to change. And the people that are first to do it will usually lead. And I believe that to be true. And I wasn't a big social media guy, but once I recognized how important it was to our business, there was no question. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it, dude. Well, and then, you know, like, I mean, Facebook, man, like once it doesn't take, anybody can learn it in a week. And I don't know right. what the ad spend is. Today. I know for a while there, it was like, once you get to spend 25 bucks a day, Facebook gives you your own coach. Like, right, right, right? like they teach right. you exactly, you know, I mean, they won't teach right. you ad copy and whatever, but they like functionally how to use the system. Like they, like they have right. a massive vested, vested interest in you. And it's, you know, like when I started first doing Facebook ads for my real estate business, this was maybe like four years ago and, and right out of the gate, you know, I mean, we were, you know, I don't know, first six months, maybe like one out of 300 leads. And then uh, six months to a year mark, it got, you know, we, we eventually after about a year got it done to one out of a hundred. Yeah, but awesome, now right. today, like we're one out of 38. Um, and, our, and our cost per leads like $3.30, right? So the acquisition cost wow. is, but it's like, you know, what we're doing with that though now is like, okay, you know, right? Like they opt in as a lead. And then once they become a lead, of course, we got emails and texts mm -hmm. and we're calling them, right? Mm -hmm. But then we throw them in a retargeting campaign with just mm -hmm. flooding with client testimonials. And then they're seeing our name in our face everywhere they go, which every time somebody sees your name in your face, it creates a higher level of comfort. 
So by the time we get on the phone with us, like they, they are so familiar with us, right? So, and, yeah, and, well and we're not even talking about the, the, the time savings, dude, and the follow-up and the reach outs. I mean, it's, it's cut our reach out time per client in half. Yeah, right. Um, and I'm like, dude, like people are like, you know, I mean, guys like you and I, I guess we see the results of it. And it's hard to articulate how amazing it is, but I'm like, I just, I can't fathom people. Not no, but it's great feedback. You said, Josh, you know, one of, one of the largest mistakes that we make as agents or entrepreneurs in any trade, uh, especially in real estate though, is lack of follow-up and these technology, these technological pieces from ads to drip campaigns to, uh, CRM marketing and chip mail, et cetera, uh, or drip mail they allow those constant reminders and touches that you mentioned, you know, your face and your name or a picture, your logo in their inbox. All of us wake up. The first thing we do is we pick up our phones. Um, even sometimes before brushing our teeth, it's next to our, you know, nightstand. We look at that phone, we turn the alarm off or check out the time. Then we open up our email. We go to our social media, check out our Facebook, check out our Instagram. Well, that's where everyone is. That's where your, our prospects are. So the question is, how do we get there with them? And these tools are available to us. So, um, well said, man, with, with the way you put that down. I agree. Yep. Yep. Awesome, man. So then, um, outside of social media, dude, like what's your, what's your like favorite piece of technology you're using, you know, any, and any element in your business that you're just loving? Well, we're, we're a huge fan of Salesforce for the CRM piece. It integrates with uh, every other tool. Uh, we got some auto auto dialer tools that we're using. Um, out, I mean, outside of the social media branding, that's, that's where it comes in. We're, we're, not doing a lot of print type uh, advertising. We do a lot of, uh, sometimes we do mailers to specific farms when we want to run a campaign. Uh, but we do a lot of that more for brand recognition more than lead conversion. Um, our, our greatest leads today still is shaking hands and meeting people. You know, um, Michael Ferry put it down years ago, uh, one of the, the legends in the RE game when it comes to coaching and prospecting. And he had a rule called, I believe the 552, and it was, you want to have two listings a week. You got to shake 50 hands and have 50 conversations. So 50 handshakes, 50 conversations, two listings a week. And you know what? 50 is a big number. So is two listings a week. And people don't get that. So maybe, if you know, you want to start scaling, start with 10 handshakes, 10 conversations a day. Do the math. You know, it'll be a fifth of what two would be for that week, but it's still better than zero. And I still believe that, warm market or personal interaction connections is the best source of actually getting the deal or getting the business. People don't make a decision by what they see normally behind the screen or behind the phone or behind the newspaper or print ad. They make that decision when they connect with you, when they see that you care, when they see that you're, you're genuine, sincere, when you're vulnerable, um, when you're real. And it's tough to predict or assume all that behind the screen. Yeah, I love it, man. I mean, if you, I mean, NAR, one, one thing that they do is such a brilliant job at is the yearly data and the reports that they give us. They just every year, and it's crazy how many agents don't read it, but I'm like, this is gold, right? So, and the statistics have been the same for the last 85 years, but last year, 5.3 million homes sold in the United States. 59% of buyers and sellers chose their realtor, you know, right, based on it was either a past real estate agent, friend, family member, your coworker, or neighbor, and or referral from one of those sources. Well said. Not direct mail is 1%. You know, open house, well buyers, sellers average 5%. Look at all phone prospecting combined is only 6%, right? So, right. so it's like all these agents are fighting all these damn scraps. I'm like, dude, right. like, you're neglecting the gold. It's right in front of you, bro. You're, and you're not going to have the, probably the big objections that you're getting from the expired. You said it, man. We, uh, we, uh, one line that we always say is, you don't know if you don't go. <laughs> and a lot of people don't know what that means, but it, you, you got to get up uh, behind that phone, outside of that, that chair, behind your desk, get up and get out there, get out there and let people know who you are, what you do. It's so easy to strike a conversation up with people, you know, one liner, just learn them, talk about the news, talk about sports, then break the ice into who you are and what you do, learn about what they do, what their goals are. Um, everyone is, is going to need a place to live, whether they're renting they're going to end up buying. And if they're buying, they're going to probably sell their home and buy another home, or they're going to keep that home and buy an investment home. But everyone needs a great realtor. And the other thing I wanted to touch on is you mentioned NAR, which uh, tremendous respect that you know those statistics and actually follow that. There are so many licensed salespeople that do not become realtors just because they don't see the value of paying into joining their association. And I was guilty of that for my first two years because I was like, why am I going to spend a thousand bucks a year? I don't need these tools. 
huge false. You need to plug in, uh, you know, your local realtor or your local real estate association, realtor association makes a big difference, especially if they're at, as active as ours. We're with OCAR, Orange County Association of Realtors, but they of course partner with CAR, uh, which is California. And then NAR, NAR is the largest nonprofit organization in the country. They have over 1.4 million members. How could you not want to plug into the largest network in the country? People who aren't real estate agents wish they could be part of NAR. Yeah. And here we are as licensed salespeople worried about the dues of joining this membership. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, good if, for you, Josh. If we didn't get access to that data, <clears throat> let's just say being a member, I mean, I'd usually pay 20 grand a year for that data. Right. Yeah, right. I right. mean, it, it is, it, it's like, dude, like, you talk about your business plan, right? Like other than being able to articulate what your numbers are and tracking your numbers, it's like they give you everything that you need to know to from a brokerage recruiting side or team leader recruiting side to, you know, what the consumer wants. I mean, they're the True. only ones that really deliver it to us. Yeah, well said, man. Yeah, love it, dude. Appreciate so um, I know we're going a little bit long on time, so just a couple last questions for you here. Um, sure. So, uh, you know, I know you talked about, uh, um, you know, going you know ex expansion um like what, what's your what's your ultimate vision for this man like, like you know how big do you want to take this bad boy you know it's it's tough because i know that as as a leader individuals need to have a concrete path and have a 5 10 20 year vision and i had that for for a while however there are so many curveballs that get thrown in front of you that you got to be quick to adapt quick to change right now we are focused on one providing the most and greatest amount of value we can in in the in this counties that we have shops in which is san francisco orange county and san diego we want to be the dominant go-to when it comes to real estate investments land development etc from there we want to scale we want to scale to um you know other cities in other states scottsdale definitely is on the radar east coast miami austin is just booming right now when it comes to real estate opportunity ohio we're looking at ohio big time i mean these might sound some some, some rural spots or like why there I'm, I'm tracking real estate activity outside of California and Ohio and Austin right now are just leading indicators of where things are, are trending and going. Uh, Greenville, Greenville out there in the East Coast, yeah. tremendous opportunity. So, you know, we, we don't want to limit ourselves, but right now we're focused on being the go-to uh, for everyone in Orange County, San Diego and San Francisco when it comes to uh, either purchasing your first home, um, having some commercial property that you want to either go take a look at or wanted to uh, sell and, and get your greatest buck on, if not pulling in and getting your taste of investment uh, or real estate investments through LLPs. Yeah. No, I love it, dude. Not, I don't think, um, you know, I know, as you said, like we're, we're so conditioned of get out of this five year, 10 year, you know, whatever, right. but like you, man, like, I don't know, it's probably about two years ago. I just got sick of it, man. I'm just like, dude, like, thank you. I'm, I'm attaching this bullshit because I'm told I'm supposed to, but really means nothing to me. At the end of the day, it's just, hey, man, I'm going to show up do everything I can to be the best version of myself, grow and expand into the best version of myself. And uh, wherever Andrew, it goes, it goes, dude, right? Thank you, Josh, for being honest and, and breaking that down because you have no idea how many people tell me like, oh, if you don't have a five or 10 year vision, you don't know this and that. And I don't want to argue that, but the fact is like, you got to be so focused on the present and what's going on now, because if you're constantly looking ahead, one, you're not enjoying the process and recognizing to learn from the mistakes that you're making in front of you. But second, like if you're always working and fast forward, when do you get a chance to enjoy what it is yeah. you're doing? <laughs> yeah. And we grew up conditioned and prone to this. I mean, it's, it actually takes practice to break that mold of yeah. not constantly living for next week, next week, next week, or, or I should say next five years or next 10 years, even though those are obviously important, but the actions you take today is going to determine where you are then. Yeah. And I'm a big believer that we are where we are now based on the, the decisions that we made three to five years ago, no matter how small or big, if people break that down and they think about where they are, good or bad, you made some decisions three to five years ago that led you to being at this point right now. Yeah, I love it, dude. And I think there, you know, when we were conditioned that way, there's there probably a time and a place where that made sense because things move so much slower. But dude, dude, six months today is equivalent to 20 years, you know, two decades ago, right? On point, man. I love it. Like, and that's why I love your show. Yeah, like five years ago, dude, I would have never, you know, like, I mean, I started a, a teamed up with a, a partner and we started a software company about three and a half years ago. And I, if you asked me five years ago, if I'd be in software, I'd be like, hell no, I don't know anything about code writing. I, and now we're right. all the United States, Canada, you know, 2000 users. Perfect are, example. And I would example. have never freaking fathomed or guessed that, right? And so congrats on that venture too. Congrats, Josh. Yeah, thanks, awesome. brother. Um, Absolutely. Right, dude, so, um, 
knowing everything that you know now today, yeah. if you could go back to yourself when you first started this real estate journey and give yourself two pieces of advice that you feel would have just fast forward this trajectory of, of success, again, with knowing everything you know now, what would those two pieces of advice look like? The first one is um, do not take advice from anybody that you would not be willing to trade shoes with immediately, that person. Um, that's one thing that we're so, so many of us fall victim to, of uh, just asking the wrong people for advice. And it's, it's perfectly normal to get reconfirmation or, or, or try to find support for the idea that you have. But if we're asking the wrong people, you're going to get the wrong answer. And the second piece is, um, you know, don't ask people who don't have investments about investments. Don't ask people who don't own a home if, if someone else should buy or own a home. I mean, that's the biggest conflict that I see when I'm talking to someone who's um, renting and I'm like, well, why don't you buy a place? And like, oh, well, I spoke to my uncle and he's like, I, I don't need to buy a house right now. I was like, oh, does your uncle own a home? No, he doesn't either. You're asking the wrong people. Um, and, uh, you know, those are really the, the biggest two is just make sure you're very keen to whose advice it is you're asking for. And second, whose advice it is that you're taking because everyone's ready to give their opinion. Yeah. Yeah. It's a difference between hearing it and then listening, right? Well said, man. Yeah. Well said. Love it, dude. All right. So last thing, man, um, you know, cause I know you got a lot going on. You've got your own podcast. Um, All mindset. Yeah. Mindset Chronicles. Josh, if I can just throw that in there, it's the mindset Chronicles on iTunes, man. Okay, Mindset Chronicles. And is it is it on iTunes or do you have a website that you that we can do? Uh, yeah, you can go to all allmindset.com. You'll learn all about it. Um, allmindset.com. But uh, there's a link there from uh, SoundCloud to iTunes. And what we do is we interview entrepreneurs, many realtors on there, many financial experts, many business owners on just mindset, the mistakes they've made, the successes they've had. And the goal is just to provide value to those that might be in similar predicaments or entering business that want to prevent some of the mistakes and learn from the successes of those people. Yeah. Love it, man. Um, all right. So you got the millennial leadership network. That's right. And 85% of our, at least according to YouTube, you know, 85% of, uh, of our listener base are millennials. I believe uh, it. I think I it's, it, you know, I, I hear you talking about that and it's like, dude, like I want to get, I always want to give back. I, I believe in leading from a place of contribution, but I'm like, this is also, a massive place, you know, for potential, uh, you know, recruits and, you know, not yes. to be necessarily going in there and trying to recruit, but I mean, I don't think there's any better opportunity for anybody to start in their entrepreneurship career than real estate. Right. So to lead to so many opportunities. So like, I know you said you're looking for some leaders, like how do, or if people just want to be a part of, it. maybe they don't want a leadership role, but how do like, where do they go? How do they plug in? Josh, thank you for asking. And uh, I want you to know that one, you're providing tremendous value to the millennials. This uh, show GSD uh, get shit done. Awesome title. So on point. I've seen the material and just thank you for impacting so many millennials and many that might never meet you. That's going to take away from, from your work and efforts, but um, you can find us at presentfp.com or pfpagency.com, but present FP for present financial um, properties.com or present FP. Again, that's where you can find us online millennialslead.com will also be able to uh, direct you to the millennials leadership network. But you mentioned something about uh, recruits and I know you said, Hey, it's not maybe the goal, but I'm a big believer that you are either recruiting or you're being recruited. There is no in between and there is nothing wrong with either being recruited or recruiting. And there's sometimes a negative connotation to that, but whatever opportunity that we have, if it's truly a great one that you believe in, you're providing a service for introducing it to somebody else. Whereas if you feel guilty for recruiting somebody, you got to reevaluate the opportunity that you yourself are in if you feel that way. So I'm a big believer in recruiting. I was recruited into the financial services business. I was recruited into the real estate industry and my goal is to pay it forward. So if I don't recruit people back into this space, I just don't believe in it myself, which is a huge false. I do. So anyone looking to join real estate, uh, even if it's not with our firm, any way that I can help out, uh, provide any value to you can find me on Instagram CEO accredited um, is my handle I'm on Twitter I'm also on LinkedIn I leverage LinkedIn tremendous you know to a huge weight even before I did Instagram or Facebook I invested in LinkedIn which is so underutilized but you can find me on there under Sina Azari yeah love it dude love it man I know that you, you name dropped the the website for your brokerage um, but we've got you know I mean well, you need the largest agent population in the, in the, in the country. Right. And, and yeah. our biggest listener base, plus my biggest 
you know, California is number one for my coaching clients or for our software clients. Awesome. So I know that we have a big following that's out there, man. I love everything that you're up to and that you're doing. And if, Thank you, Josh. Um, um, any of those that are watching, listening that are in your area, dude, that, you know, want, want to talk to you about, you know, uh, joining your amazing company, you like, what's the best place to do that? Well, reach out to me directly or go to our website, uh, presentfp.com, or just hit me up, hit me up, find me on social, CEO accredited, or look up Sina Azari, send me a DM, send me a hello, a shout out, drop a comment in this uh, clip once it's posted online, and let's go from there. Or reach out to you, GSD, man, connect with Josh. Yeah. This guy definitely has everything going well, so if, if he doesn't direct you to me, he's going to direct you to the right portal regardless, I could tell. Yeah. No, I love it, dude. Love it, man. I appreciate the kind words. And those that are watching and listening, I know I end every podcast with this, but information without implementation is truly just the start of delusion. Information isn't power. It's taking that information, taking massive action on it that creates the power in our lives. First, to create the lives that we truly know we want and deserve. And Cena shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you guys. They take something that you learn. Don't wait, start implementing and taking immediate action on it. And again, all this information, all the links that we just talked about will be right below this, wherever you're at, um, we'll have those there. And uh, as always, thank you guys so much for, for taking the time out of your busy days to be here and watch and listen and supporting the show and seeing a man. This has been an honor. This has been a hell of a lot of fun. And this is, uh, I don't, you're probably one of the mo most transparent, just, just upfront, thank real, you. you know, a real estate brokers I've ever had on the show, man. And it was, it was a pleasure, dude. Truly appreciate, appreciate it. it. Respect for what you do with GSD, Josh. Thank you so much. My honor, man. 100% my man. All right, you guys. Thanks again. And we will see you next time.